Swarty47 here, aka Austin Swanson. Um, in this video, I am going to be going over how to analyze an investment property. Um, I'm specifically, I'm looking at residential, and even more specifically, I'll be looking at um, a duplex for this video. Uh, but this video is also going to be used as a way to uh, go over and explain how to use this calculator. So just as some background about myself, um, I'm very big into investing. I love investing. I love uh, private companies. I love looking at public companies or stocks. And I am big into real estate. Uh, my wife has been a property manager for th for some time now, for quite a, <laughs> quite a while, uh, managing you know large apartment complexes and then managing the properties we own. So uh, my wife and I own some real estate properties as well. And so back when, before I started buying properties, I wanted to use calculators because I'm like, how do I know if this is a good deal? I mean, there's so many, you'll hear the you know, the 1% rule or all these other things, but I'm like, I want to know I'm an actuary. That's, you know, I went to school, graduated with mathematics and actual science. Um, I've been an actuary for like five years now. I'm an FSA. I, uh, I'm just saying this for all the background purposes in terms of I deal with Excel a lot. I love Excel. I use it for everything. I have Excel files for everything. And so I would use these calculators online before I knew what I was looking for, right? Before I knew what numbers to look for and what I needed. And I would use like the bigger pockets calculator or other free ones that are online and just not everything had what I needed. And so just to kind of give you a rundown, I have this little instructions tab. Uh, which just kind of goes over what's in here, uh, contact information. So I did. I'm putting a link down below. Um, I am actually putting this up for sale. This this uh, this calculator. Um, again, there's free ones out there, um, and this video can also be used for just how to analyze properties. But there's information of if you do use this of contacting me, my website, Twitter, whatever, because I I use this calculator. So I want people if there's issues to let me know because then it's like I want to know for my properties as well. So uh, I have a template for just residential, uh, if buy and hold, no refinances, no burr, buy, rent, or buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, which is my, the, my favorite strategy of being able to recycle that initial uh, investment. And so I have a tab for that as well. All right, and going in through here, and we'll walk through all of this. And I actually have um, an example pulled up that I, I haven't actually ran the numbers on. Um, I'm kind of interested anyway, so it's kind of, it's the best of both worlds here. Uh, but a reason why I kind of wanted to do this is I put a lot of effort. I mean, I've, I've been using this calculator for like two years, maybe actually more than that even. And I have filled this out with, I mean, there's some actually quite a bit of notes of explaining things, making sure numbers tie out perfectly, doing some quite a bit of complicated formulas, but I can go through it, explain you know the gist of everything. And a really nice feature is to be able to just go in, do print, and have a nice little report that summarizes everything that you would need to know. And again, it's stuff that as someone who's buying investment properties, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So I think the best idea is just to kind of quickly go through this and go through an example. And so I will actually, because I, I tried to match the residential real estate template and the residential real estate burr template uh, to be pretty much the same. Just with there's going to be numbers pre rehab or yeah pre rehab at purchase right then uh, post rehab. So how a burr typically works, and that's why I just kind of want to walk through this quickly. Um, maybe actually maybe it's best if we do both templates. Maybe that's the easiest way, and I can explain both of them. That might be better. I like that idea. I like that idea. So let's pull up this property. So I see that it's just the first one. I searched Des Moines, Iowa, uh, multifamily, and I see this property. Beautiful, right? Duplex, which I like. One roof. Uh, looks like two driveways. Um, exterior, I mean, there's some toys or something. A little place that nice car. Which is always a good sign. Get kind of an idea. It's not some, you know, broken down vehicle outside. That actually looks like a really nice vehicle. If that's for this place, and I think it is. I, I can go in Street View to see if these both. Yeah. So it looks like both these lots. This looks pretty nice. Uh, decent neighborhood. I mean, we're this is this this is the perfect one to analyze. I'm excited. So let's just go through the pictures real quick. Just I'm trying to give you an idea of how I think through this. So no garage, which someone could not like. Uh, which is fine. We're at 189.9. Um, I typically, 
But, okay, so here's an interesting thing, is the square footage is 1920 So that's actually quite a bit of square footage. Price per square foot, under $100 a square foot, which is pretty, pretty good. Um, how, at least in my area, in the Midwest, or even in Iowa, so residential, single-family homes are comped at, uh, based on price per square foot. Duplexes, up to fourplexes. You might see some appraisals go for, uh, based on price per square foot, or they'll do it based on rent. Um, the last appraisal I got when I did a cash out refinance was based on the rent, the gross rent. Um, and so I actually usually like to see a low purchase price and a low price per square foot because if I'm negotiating, I can say, hey, um, you only have 1,400 square feet and based on the comps in the area of price per square foot, you know, I can justify it that way even though the appraisal will go a different way. And that's not the same everywhere, but just trying to give you some background. So anyways, I do kind of like that there's a lot of square footage because uh, that might be easier to rent out. Someone's maybe comparing on a square footage basis. Four bedrooms, one bath. I'm assuming it's one bath in each one. <laughs> I'm sure it's not shared. And I'm assuming it's two and two. Like uh, it's two bed, one bath in each one, but we'll quickly look. Inside looks clean, nice carpet. I would probably paint. I, I, I like to do the same gray paint. Uh, I can't remember the exact one we use. I want to say it's essential gray, but I always have it wrong. Uh, my wife, the, the, the one who manages the properties, she knows. Carpet, I, I'd probably leave until we need a new one. Um, we've done luxury vinyl playing flooring, and I don't want... It's just a lot of work, and it's kind of expensive, but it lasts a long time. Uh, I, I do, I'm currently just doing white trim. I know I've heard black and gray trim is what's in, but I know white trim will probably last a while and it's a nice contrast with the gray paint and I'll probably just stick with that for a while. So, and I would also do the doors white as well. Um, it would match the front door. It would change the light. This yellow light is really weird. <laughs> uh, do a nice led bulb that would last a long time and brighten it up. Paint them cabinets. That is one of my favorite things to do right now is to go in and, just paint the cabinets. It's amazing. Paint them white. Do, do some new fixtures. Oh, it's amazing. Even this material, this weird, uh, like, I don't even know what you would call this material of wood. You can, especially in this corner, I think you can see this right here. This doesn't look <laughs> great. And also, very cool tip. I have, oh, I have so many tips. There's so many things we could do. I get so excited about all this, guys. Um, is so we've tried wrapping the so we, we've bought new countertops we've done you know try to do something really nice we've wrapped them where you like kind of like put this like film over it but we've had over a year a tenant live in it and then move out and it cuts very easy they put a hot plate on it it's just not the grace so a new thing we found that's actually really nice is you can actually paint the uh countertops and there's some cheap paint, but it's really strong smell. So you need like a really heavy duty, like N95 mask. Um, and so, but it works out and looks really nice. Overall, big kitchen, really like it. I like that it's actually outdated because that means I can use that for negotiation purposes. Say we have to do this and this and this, and we can turn it around and make this presumably worth a lot and be an easy rent. I mean, overall, the structure looks nice. Those doors, I mean, paint them. I think it might work fine. <laughs> Uh, get a new bathroom mirror, do a new light fixture, paint again, basement. That's a big sell. That's a nice basement. Very big. I'm really actually impressed by this. Um, outside looks good. I can't see if it's, it looks like it's separate electrical meters. I don't know about water. I can't quite see that. Um, it's not a make or break lawn looks so, so, uh, but overall, I mean, this is actually really nice back backyard it's not fenced in which is fine um typically i do actually allow pets or we allow pets for some of our rental properties because i think this is the way i rationalize it a lot of my family and friends almost everyone has a pet and these are all people i would love to rent to i would love to rent to them and so it's like if i just said oh not for my property it's like i then if i exclude pets right all my friends and family wouldn't be able to live with me. And so you're getting rid of a huge portion of the population that are great people. And so uh, you just have a pet deposit, pet fee, whatever, right? And so um, you just got to keep that in mind. That's just something I do. So overall, like the property. So those are just my first thoughts. Anything else? Let's see the year. I'm, I'm going to say 1980. Looks really nice. Maybe even newer. 1990? 1971. So actually, I'm impressed because this actually looks very nice for that age. Price per square foot, $99. Um, overall, that's pretty much what I want to see. I mean, I don't think it says how much the rents are, but that doesn't really matter to me, uh, just because I will charge what I want to charge what I think is best. 
and we can talk about that here in a sec. So let's let's start going through this, right? And I could probably pull up, have these both up at the same time. Uh, that should work. Let me make this smaller, maybe. We'll see. Let's see how we can do this. Okay. So date just has it as of today. The current price. So 189.9. Uh, number of buildings one. The reason for this is if there was multiple buildings, maybe they were selling like two or three. Uh, duplexes or something along those lines. Why that would matter is I'd probably have to have separate closings because these are residential. And one key thing to know. So you have residential, which does include, actually, I mean, this is the way you, you'll talk to different people and they'll say it differently. Residential can be from zero units to a million units, right? Residential, because it's just residential is an asset class of people living there. You're, you'll have residential loans, which are from one to four units, typically it might depend on states, because uh, I've seen up to five. But then you have commercial loans for residential mortgages from five and above. It's so confusing, but I'm just kind of like, and again, you can say otherwise, and other people will say otherwise, and I totally understand that. But the reason for that is when you just say, oh, this is you know residential versus commercial. If you say it that way, like commercial is just a huge asset class, that industrial, retail, uh, all these other things, and it's just yes, apartments are commercial. Um, but they're also, in, within that, they're residential, okay? I'm just kind of putting that up. So uh, property type, this has, I have a little drop-down menu, less than, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, make this a little easier. Uh, that should be good. And actually, I should flip this around so you can actually see, because I'm in the way. Let's see here. You can tell I'm just doing this all on the fly, which is good, it's authentic, right? There we go, okay. So there's less than four. Why does this matter? Because if you're under four, uh, it, it gets appraised different. So on this tab, tab it's not going to make a difference. But on this Burr one down down below, when you do a refinance, the appraisal matters. It's the the loan amount will be based on that appraisal, and so it does matter uh, if it's less than four or greater than four. If it's less than four, it's based on comps um, like price per square foot or maybe gross rent. Or if it's greater than four, if it's five and above, and I apologize if I've said anything different in between here, there's, it's, <laughs> they're all so close. But if it's five and above, then it's based on your net operating income divided by the cap rate to get your value. And we could always have a, you can always message me anywhere here, Twitter, leave a comment, and I'm happy to describe more about it. Uh, potential rent. So I actually have uh, properties uh, around this area, and I know. Easily, I think these could go for about nine, like eight ninety-five a unit. This is actually pretty nice, nineteen twenty, uh, so almost a thousand square feet per place. There's no garage, which kind of is a trade-off. So just to run the numbers, I like to be on the safe side. I'm gonna assume both are eight ninety-five. Okay, I think that's a it's a safe bet. So I'll say eight ninety-five. Um, is good so 1790 total if i actually and maybe i'll even update this if i just do the one percent rule right i take how much rent i'm getting building it's almost exactly one percent right so um round it up it is 94 so that's actually a good sign and what that says it's kind of this like rule of thumb to say hey uh for this purchase price am i going to get enough rent to cover my expenses, my mortgage, property, uh, uh, like maintenance, taxes, insurance, all those things. If you have 1% of the purchase price that's cover that's coming in rent, you usually are okay. And we'll see if that's the case. Okay, updates that are needed. We, I don't think, I, off the top of my head, I don't know if there's anything for roof, siding, gutters. What I hope for is there's not, and that within a year or two, you know, I'm having rent come in and I'm gonna be saving a portion for those capital expenditures which are big repairs. Um, and so I'll hopefully have that happen. There always can be surprises. One of my first properties, uh, we had like a, oh gosh, like a, a, a surprise that was equal to like 50% of what we bought the place for. It was bad. We bought the place cheap. Need a lot of work, but there was uh, we needed all new siding and because it was bad, there was a lot of rot underneath the siding that was put above. So you can always have surprises. Cabinets, I think we're gonna paint them. Um, and I would say it's just gonna be paint if we do it, if we hire it out, I've done it before, and that's about it's a lot, it's so much work. It is so much more work to paint cabinets uh, than to paint walls. If you do it yourself, you just need to buy the paint, which would be like 500 bucks. Um, I know I've, I just got quoted for about 2000 And so actually for this, I'm going to say that I would do it. Maybe I'd hire like a handyman we can get for half price. So 1250 
Ugh, not that much. 1250. Flooring, I think we're good. It actually looked really nice. Paint per unit. I do think we're going to need to do painting. I think that might be a thousand a unit. Again, it, it, it's so dependent on where you're at, but this gives you an idea how this calculator works and how I'm thinking. But I'll say it's a thousand. Actually, I'll, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to say it's 1500, but per unit. So times two. Foundation, I'm going to assume it's good. Plumbing, I'm going to assume it's good. Landscape, uh, I think it's fine. I think it's okay. Electrical, I think it's okay. Mis miscellaneous, I probably do new doorknobs, do new lights, new light fixtures, new uh, new n house numbers. You can kind of just, uh, just it doesn't look great. So honestly, there's quite a bit of that. I'll just do two thousand. So this just summed them all up. We have about four thousand four hundred fifty dollars that are going to be needed in repairs. Not awful, not awful. Uh, inspection for my ear is about three hundred dollars a unit. So I'll do three hundred times two. Uh, you can do the plus sign instead of the equal sign, just so you guys know what why I'm doing that. It's easy, so I can use on the, the side of my my keyboard. I'm doing a plus, maybe TMI. Closing costs. So in my area, for my community banks, it's $1,800 to do closing, okay, per building. That's, that's why it's times how many buildings there are. The difference is, is I'm including escrow because I like having everything bundled in of my property uh, insurance and taxes. So what it's doing... And I'll zoom, oh, let me just zoom out so you can get a better picture of everything here. And I'll go full screen. Is it's taking $1,800 per building plus six months of taxes and insurance. Okay, that's what that's doing. So I know when I go to closing, I'm going to need about $4,000 for this building for just that. So I'm going to say my accepted price. I'm going to just, just to know how good this price is, uh, their asking price. I'm going to say I, I went in and bought it for 189 All in, I have my 189 purchase price plus my closing costs, inspections, and total repairs, which gives me about $199,000. Um, that's how much like this whole thing's worth. But I'll have a loan, and so that'll bring it down. Uh, purchase price, 189 again. Uh, loan amount is going to be based on my down payment. Because this is a duplex, uh, instead of a, the typical 20% in my area for my banks, I'll have to do 25%. Interest rate, 3% is I think what I, I recently got. It might be a little bit lower. I'll do it over 30 years, a 30-year amortization. That's the loan term. And then I'm going to be holding this loan for 30 years. This doesn't matter as much in this tab, but in the refinance, you might only hold the first loan for six months or a year, refinance, and get a new loan. Okay? Cash needed. So what this is, I don't need 180, or 199000 I need, based on 25% of the purchase price, but plus my closing costs, my inspection, and my total repairs. So I'm going to need $56,000 to do that. To close, I don't need the repairs. And I don't need the inspection. I'll do that beforehand, so maybe I do need it. But in te technically, what, just what I need to know what I'm going to need to bring to the table is about $51,000. I love knowing these numbers because... Again, people will ignore closing costs or other little, like, the escrow account. And it's like, oh, it's a, it can be a surprise, especially if you start getting to larger properties and you're doing an escrow account and you need six months of taxes or insurance. That adds up. Um, appreciation. So if you're dealing with a larger commercial, residential, you know, the, the five and, and above, it's based on the appreciation is actually increases in the NOI, right? You're actually increasing the value of the property through forced appreciation or rental increases or increasing the NOI. We are dealing with a duplex, which is uh, going to be appraised based on you know the, the price per square foot or the gross comps. And so I might just do an actual like appreciation, just the normal flat percentage in this case, right? And so for me, that will be, I'll say 3%. That's about how much I, we, we increase rents. It's kind of around the inflation number. And so the, the way that this one's working, and I'll exp I guess I should say, this is the appreciation in this is based on the building itself. So this is going to be increasing the 189 by 3% a year. But I'll also, because I do a lot of different calculations in here, I have this rent increase, okay? This explains how much I'm increasing rent by, which increases the 1790. And what we can see here, we have 1790, and every year I increase by 3%. After a year, so you have the year, it ends, it goes to year two, it jumped up 3%. That's how that works. Um, in terms of, let's see if I can show you the other one, the cumulative equity. This is based on how much is getting paid down 
plus the appreciation of the home. So you're getting both benefits. So as you pay down the mortgage, your equity increases, but as the value of the home increases, you get that as well. So, I mean, we're getting some nice appreciation. And, it, and what I wanna know is like, okay, this is my cumulative equity, but it's like, how much equity do I actually, did I earn? Cumulative equity earned. So the first year I have some, you know, mortgage pay down plus some, uh, I don't have any appreciation. So this is all mortgage pay down because I believe I base it on uh, after one year. I'm doing a stair step every year, goes up by the 3%, not on a monthly basis. I think you might see otherwise, but I can't. Cumulative equity. Nope. Take that back. <laughs> Cumulative equity. It's taking uh, the amount. There we go. I was wrong. It's taking the accepted offer price, 189, times one plus the appreciation and doing it on a monthly basis where it goes up in value and then I'm minusing M, let's see here, the mortgage balance to see how much my equity is. So I am, okay, so it's going up on a monthly basis. Okay, and then, um, sorry if that's a little confusing. We can go back to the numbers, but I just wanted to show you, you know, essentially what I was getting at. This appreciation impacts how much the value of the property is going up, and then the other one is showing how much the rent's going up, okay? Expenses are all these minus the mortgage. So all these expenses right here, those are gonna go up 3% a year. Reinvestment of cash flows. So at the end, at, you know, you have your rent come in, you pay off your principal and interest, your taxes, your insurance, all the other expenses, and you're left with your cash flow. Well, what am I going to do with that cash flow? I can put it in a checking account, but I also would like, and, and if that's the case, maybe just put 0% for your reinvestment of cash flows, but I might put it in an index fund and I'll earn 7%. So I just kind of want to see what that looks like when I start doing projections a long time from now to see how good this is. Uh, monthly repairs and cap X. So monthly repairs are, you know, toilet breaks. Cap X is how much I'm saving from every rent check for those future the big roof or a foundation thing. I, we, I mean, a general thing, you'll see 5%, 10% higher. So I just, for the sake of this, I'll do seven and a half percent right in the middle. Vacancy, save a little portion of your rent each month because at some point uh, after a year, the, the property will turn over, someone will move out and you need to have money to pay for everything. The, the expenses, the mortgage, uh, the mortgage, all that. And so I typically assume, you'll see this 8.33. It's like, why is that so specific? The formula, one divided by 12, essentially I'm assuming one month of vacancy, okay? Property management, we manage ourselves, so it's 0%, but you could easily put in something else. So for our sake, we're pulling in 1920, okay? We have our principal and interest based on our loan amounts. So that is actually all calculated. So I should say, <laughs> I should have said, it's on the instructions tab. Give me a break. But the yellow is all things you need to fill out while the white is stuff that's already calculated. So the white is calculating based on this formula. Um, taxes. So we need to calculate this. So I will just for the sake of it, I could go on the Polk County Assessor, which is what this county is. But if you, what usually you have here, here we go. So it's already has it on what their, their taxes were. And so I will do 250 divided by 12 to get my monthly tax amount. Property insurance. So I've, this this or, this is hit or miss. Um, usually I'm assuming about $1,000 for my properties. Uh, you can easily get quotes for free. You can reach out to people. Sometimes actually, if we go here, this is better, is Zillow will also do your home insurance. 66 bucks. So I might be, again, this is totally random. It might be close. I'm at 83 versus 66. I'll be more conservative and stay with the 66. Monthly repairs, it's white. Don't have to do anything because it's based on, wait, let me get this full screen again. It's based on that 7.5% uh, that we originally mentioned. Um, cap X, same thing. It's based on the formula, based on the percentage of 7.5 I did before. Utilities. Um, I am going to assume, so usually you can build back, you can, you know, if it's separate meters, the tenant can pay for the utilities like in this duplex, right? If it's not separately metered, you can do the ratio utility billing system where you're billing them back based on you know certain factors, square footage, how many people are in the, the units. Um, to make it easy, I'll assume I'm paying water and garbage because maybe it's not an individual, like water and garbage is this is through the same company or the, the, the state or city. Um, 
So those are together. And so if water's not separated, I'm likely going to just pay it myself, but I can adjust rent if needed. So I'll say that's $40 uh, because that's what we're paying for a duplex in our area. Um, vacancy, sure. Uh, that's, oh, that's based on the, the, the rent times that eight and a half percent that we talked about. Property management, 0%, so $0. And then we have miscellaneous. This actually, I, so with this duplex, I will likely have them shovel and, um, you know, take care of the lawn. And as long as you tell people ahead of time that that's what's expected, most people are okay. You just don't want to surprise someone and say, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, that's not going to work. And so um, I, I won't have to do, like I won't have to pay for a mower or for someone to shovel or snow, uh, snow removal. So I think, let me, let me see. So I put lawn, snow, cleaning, legal, PMI. Um, I think we're okay with assuming zero. So right now, it's almost like, am I missing something? Because Four hundred and thirty-eight dollars is really good. <laughs> it's really good. Cash on cash return nine percent. Cap rate seven percent. So that's okay. Debt and so I guess what this means. Okay, let me go through this. So cash flow. I bring in my rent, pay off my expenses. That's how much is left, right? A lot of people assume they say, "Oh, I have my rent minus my mortgage. That's cash flow." No. <laughs> There is so many other expenses you have to pay for. Even the expenses you don't pay for that month, that CapEx, some point, I mean, the way, like, think about it. I'm saving $1,600 a year. Well, if I have to replace that roof, that might be $16,000. I mean, it might be that I'm making, people think I'm making an extra $134 a month and they do that for 10 years. And then all of a sudden they have to do a new roof and they need $16,000. If you're not saving for that, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have a nice surprise. Okay. So my true cash flow. Right, is uh, $438. Cash on cash return, which means, okay, so that formula is my cash flow <laughs> times 12, so it's annual, divided by the cash I put in the property, the cash needed. So that's a good return. So on that 56,000, I'm making, I should, uh, you know, 10%, which is pretty good, right? 5,000 a year. Cap rate. So this is more in the commercial side of things for larger properties and to be able to compare two different properties. Essentially what it's saying is based on the purchase price, right? How much am I earning uh, based on, you know, excluding debt on it? So it's on a very comparable basis, right? So if you had two properties, let's say both are uh, worth 189, you buy for 189, right? Uh, one earns 1,000 and one earns 2,000. Well, wow, obviously the one that's earning 2,000 is maybe a better deal, right? But if they're different purchase prices, it becomes a little harder to compare. And so that way you can take the rent divided by, um, or not the rent actually, it's the NOI, net operating income, which is your income minus your expenses, excluding debt. And the reason why you don't include debt is because that can vary person to person. They might put down a different down payment, they might have a different interest rate. That's just too, it's not a, a comparable way to compare two different properties. So in this situation, we're taking, we take our cash flow, we add back our principal and interest, and we add back our CapEx. And so we, because that's just what we're saving right now. And so we get our NOI and we divide it by our purchase price of 189. And I'm actually adding, and you might see this differently, but this is what I'm doing, is I know I have this much repairs. So technically, to make it more comparable, I have, I'm adding back the repairs so they're on an even basis. Again, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I love talking about all this stuff. Uh, debt service coverage ratio. What this is, is you take your NOI again, and this is a better way to even think about this. It's your uh, cash flow before paying your debt and you're dividing it by your debt payment, your principal and interest. And what this says is, I'm pulling it before I pay my debt, I am pulling in twice as much as I need to, to pay off this principal and interest. Banks will, some, will more look at this for commercial, uh, but it's good to know, it's like I'm pulling in twice as much. And just so you can see this, right? If I take my rent and I pull in, I uh, back my principal and interest because I haven't paid my, my, my mortgage yet. Um, and because CapEx is something I'm saving for, technically I'm pulling in, got to not make this, uh, I'm pulling in almost $1,200, right? Which is about double of my $600 monthly payment. That's pretty good. I should be good because what you wouldn't want and this is if you're, you know, for, it, for instance, you had much, you know, I guess it'd happen if you had like negative cash flow. but if this wasn't positive, if this was under a hundred percent, 
that might be a problem. I think usually banks want to see over 125%, but they won't. I don't think they will even look at it typically. I don't think they look at it um, for residential. They're more looking at your own criteria. They don't look at the property as much. They look at you, your credit score, and all that stuff. Um, debt service, or not debt, uh, debt to income ratio is a big one. Okay, so what I'm seeing right now, and, and my thoughts, we're analyzing this property. We're pulling in good amount. You know, usually I want to just break even. Some people say they want a hundred dollars a unit. I just want to break even the reason being, right. Let's look at this, right. Let's actually, can I like, just so you, sh I, this might be a really good example of something. Let's say I'm going to kind of manipulate this. I'm going to say that this is actually 40 plus 438, $0. Okay. Hopefully I don't forget. I mess with the utilities. Let's say I have $0 of cash flow. <laughs> okay. Some people will be like, Oh, can't invest in this property. This property's awful, right? Zero, zero, percent cash on cash return. I'm not making any money. Um, I'm covering my debt cap rate. Awful. This, this property's awful. Okay. To tweak the numbers even a little bit more. Let's say, you know, you're like, Oh, I know this a market is actually appreciating at 5% and I can actually increase these rents by 5%. All right. So again, Okay, this is this is actually let's even go a little crazy. Just just to, I like thinking in terms of extremes because it actually can really hit the point home. Let's say it's seven percent each. The home's gonna go it's it's one eighty nine now, but it's going up seven percent a year, and I can increase the rent seven percent every year. Let's let's just say that that's what you believe. I just increase those those numbers and people would be instantly like, but it doesn't cash flow this year. I'm not my cash on cash return zero. This must be an awful property, right? you can't look at point in time metrics like that. You have to think long term. And so I've created this little thing here that walks through over many years. So if I think in year one, again, my annual cash flow, six negative six dollars. My cumulative equity is quite a bit. I've made sixteen thousand. And the reason for that isn't just me paying down the mortgage because it's not gonna be that much in the first year. It's all about that seven percent. So if I actually go to my appreciation, let's look at this. You see right here where my cumulative equity earned. I just drop that down to 0%. <laughs> it goes down to 3,000. That's a huge, I'm making, what is that? An extra $13,000 from that appreciation. That's amazing. Okay. Um, and then I have my total equity, which is adding how much I've earned plus the amount that I put down because that's my money, right? That I own in that property. And I have 63,000 in the property. I didn't make any, you know, I, I only broke even. So my total amount I made was this 16,000 plus, you know, actually minus $6, which was 16,000, right? Well, I put down 51,000, right? Or 56,000. So I made $16,000 on the, on the 56. So in one year, I'm actually making a 29% return. The reason the IRR is uh, zero and I can, or negative, I can explain what this is here in a second, is because IRR remain is your internal rate of re return. And it's, you have, I have my $56,000 payment and I have these little cash flows that I'm earning, or I earn an amount every single year. And it, the IRR is the, what the number that's needed, the discount rate to bring those future cash flows or uh, payments earned back to zero so that they equal each other. It might be confusing. Um, and, it, and it is confusing. I, I like thinking of what my annual return is a lot better, but your IRR remains negative. It won't break positive until you surpass your initial down payment or your initial payment. And to kind of look at this or where this is calculating is I'm calculating it based on uh, right here. Well, I actually should do a longer payment. So let's look at, let's look at your 10 and we'll get back to the other numbers. See how it goes positive. And now these numbers are equaling, they're a lot closer to each other. If I go now and look at my IRR, my IRR, oh, is it doing it? It doesn't even show you how it's doing it. But essentially, oh, because I'm using an offset. Essentially, it's going to look at from time zero to time 10. And until, sorry, and until the sum of these, right, year four, so it should be year four, or, or is it year three? Yeah, year three it should still show a negative IRR. But in year four, it'll break positive. It'll go positive. So let's let's see if that. Let's see if I'm right here. Year three. Let's see if it's negative. It's slightly maybe slightly positive, but then year four gets bigger. So it's two negative. Two is really negative. Three because I've got enough. Four goes above. 
So essentially, I focus on the annual return. As you get farther, longer uh, durations, these start equaling the same thing. But okay, so this is where it gets interesting. We, the whole point, what I was trying to make here on analyzing this property was in year one, right? One second here. In year one, you might have dismissed this property because you're like, wow, it only earns, it, it doesn't even make any money. But in, and we can look here and say our annual cash flow is negative six. But we get to year 10, we're making $13,000. <laughs> every year which is a pretty good return on our initial 56,000. If you get to year 30, you're making $100,000 on your original uh $56,000 that you had to put into this. That's insane. Our annual compound returns 15%. So here and now to put this in a full picture. That's how much I'm making every year because if we go over to our yearly stuff, right? And we look at uh, annual cash flow, it was negative six, then went up to a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, and we get to year 30. Boom, look at that. Hundred thousand. Now, I, I'm I, again, I, I'm doing extreme numbers here. Seven percent is a ton, that's a lot. Unless you predicted that you know you're in some market and it's like it's the next San Francisco or Austin, Texas, and it's currently really low rent and you think it's going to project really high, I'd, I'd be assuming 3% or something along those lines or 5%. 7% is a lot, especially when it's compounded over that long a time. You're getting into insane rent amount, right? So like if I do uh, this rent amount times 1.0, actually 7, to the power of 30, that's saying I'm going to have a monthly rent amount I'm charging someone $13,000 30 years from now which it's hard to say 30 years is a long time. You have inflation and other factors and maybe the market's huge. 13,000 seems like a lot <laughs> in relation to today. Uh, so that's why I'm saying 7% is a crazy example. But if we go back here, um, I know I'm starting to ramble a lot more as I start getting into this, but I love this stuff, right? So what I see here, I have my annual cash flow because it appreciated so much. I've earned up $1.4 million off this property. So and my total equity, because I put some down, is now $1.4 million. Uh, I reinvested all those cash flows at 7%, again, based on my reinvestment of cash flows assumption. And my cumulative reinvestment in cash flows was $2 million. So when I add my $2 million plus my $1.4 I get my three, almost $3.5 million I made on this property over 30 years. And it cost me 56,000. So like, again, imagine you dismiss this property because you're like, it's zero, it's zero dollars. It doesn't make anything this year. You have to think in the future and that's where this gets interesting. But again, more realistic, we'll put in like the 3%. This is what I'd act, the, all these numbers are about what I'd look at. So now to actually get more realistic, in year 30, I'm making $10,000 um, a month or a year. So about $1,000 a month, which is really, that's actually really good, right? Compared to zero today, um, I, I like seeing that. Um, cumulative equity, my mortgage will be paid off by that time. And so I will have about $460,000 of equity in the property. I've earned four hundred and twelve. dollars um, When I reinvest all my cash flows up to this point, I'll have another 200000 So I've made 600000 So my annual return, is 9%. And, and and what a better way to think about that 9% and actually how I think in terms of numbers is let's say I actually went and invested this in, in you know some public company and I was able to earn 10%, right? Over 30 years. So I do that to the power of 30. The reason I'm looking down at my keyboard just to explain this is uh, I have a mic in front of me. So I have to like peek around, make sure I'm looking at the right number. So if I do this to the power of 30, I get, what am I, why is it that much more? What am I missing here? I gotta think about this for a second. Is it really that different because of the years? Ye and is this less than 9%? Is this like eight, seven or something? Eight, eight. So if I take this times eight, eight, I'll explain all this here in a second. If I take this times eight, go zero, eight, eight, that gets me closer. That gets me closer. So essentially what I'm looking at here is I'm saying, okay, so if I if I took my 56,000, invested it at 8.8%, I get very close to what I would be investing if I, uh, versus this property. So it's like, okay, if I had, you know, I had to decide between, you know, investing in a certain company or, or an index fund and this, it's like, well, it's kind of hard to say. But if I thought I could take this and earn 15%, 
my opportunity cost of, of going and investing in this property and only earning 600000 over 30 years is maybe I could have had $3.7 million. 15% <laughs> is a high return, but maybe you, uh, like me, love investing in companies and know, you know maybe where to look and have a deep interest in them, and maybe that's possible, right? And so it's something I really have to consider, and maybe I pass up on this property. And actually, I, I actually might. But if because of this reason, really, I mean, I would be thinking... Can I earn a 15%? Maybe. I, I honestly think it's it's not unrealistic. Um, if But if I was thinking compared to the typical, you know, S&P 500 index fund at 7%, then it's like, oh, I'd actually probably rather to, you know, invest in this property. This video is supposed to be five minutes. <laughs> uh, but I love it, all right? So the last thing that I'll just do, and I'll do this really quick. Actually, it won't be quick. It won't be. Uh, but is this resident, is the burr. So what a burr is, is buy, rehab, fix it up, rent it out, uh, refinance, get your money back, and repeat, buy another one. So how it works is you buy a property, this property, 189000 you make it nicer, you put in that $4,000, it's now worth more, the bank says it's worth more, They will. you'll refinance, get a new loan, they will pay off your existing mortgage, pay you back, you'll take that money, go buy a new one. So to kind of the big, the, 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 to make this click, I will put down my $56,000, hopefully get most of that back, if not all, 56000 Then I can buy a new property with that same 56000 That's why everyone likes Burr. <laughs> it's a great strategy. So let's go through this real quickly. Um, so I know, let's see if I can match this just to make this look nice. 70, 70, okay. So 189,000, so I can match all this stuff very quickly. Uh, it's a one, one, one number one building, less than four units. Um, I said 895 times two. And after rehab, I'll assume the same thing. Sometimes you could say after rehab. So I have two columns here, pre-rehab, post-rehab, or post-refinance. And so after the refinance, actually, we'll just do it. We'll say it's all fixed up. I, I might be able to get 895 as is in those units. They're pretty nice. So let's say I can get 995 after the rehab. So I can I have this all working out so I can have two different um, assumptions going on, which is really nice. So pre-rehab, I'm going to have all these repairs. So I can actually copy this, go in here, and I'll do, I just like doing paste uh, as values, which is right here. So I paste those so they're just like, exact, it'll get rid of the formulas in there, but it just kind of overlays them and it's just really nice. So I'll still, so you see there's still the same number. I'll assume that I don't have any, I'm not going to do any rehabs post um after, like I'm going to do all my rehabs up front. I rarely fill this out. Um, I just put it in here. Inspections all up front. I won't have to do an inspection post. Um, closing costs, again, it's just that formula based on how much I'm going to need for the uh, uh, escrow. And then the interesting thing, I have this, so I have this set based on the existing closing. When you go to refinance later on and you have closing costs in escrow account it'll be based on the new tax it might be based on new taxes insurance your taxes may go up and i will assume they do and i'll even assume maybe 30 percent increase because i might be doing a lot of rehab that it maybe makes the property worth more um, in this situation i'm not doing anything in the exterior so maybe actually i don't know if it will go up it might well the, no sorry i should say the difference is they might have sold sometimes you'll see this on zillow they might not have sold this property in a long time, okay? And so what happens is, let's see, so it usually says last time it sold, unless it's, it's been a while. So this this home might, if I went to the Polk County, I can actually, let's do it. I wanna show you the example here. So I can take this information, paste blank text. So I go here, it should pull up the property. This is this is the, you know, the, the city's assessor. Here's the property. Um, and it should show me last time it was sold, permit. Am I missing it? I actually never seen one like this. They removed the deck in 2007. Appeals, I'm not sure what that is. Is this the first time I'm not gonna be able to find a title holder, holder since 1981? <laughs> wow. So the assessed value currently is 119,000. The taxes might go up a ton on this thing. 
Wow. That's actually kind of surprising. 40 years? They haven't sold this? I wonder. And I can, so I can actually search these people and see what other properties they own. So they might own a lot. Maybe they're retiring and they might be have. This, this might have actually, ah, oh, I get all excited, see, you know, seeing all this. And what I'm, what I'm saying, I guess I should walk through exactly my thought process. So they haven't sold this in a while, meaning, you know, it might be, they've held this for like 40 years. They might've lived in a side, which is, you know, whatever. Um, it, it doesn't impact my, you know, assumptions here. But what it does get me is I'm wondering if they have more properties, let's just see, right? Um. I did search by the property address, didn't I? Oops. Yeah. Told you. <laughs> wow. All right. So I'm guessing this is a primary based on uh, the amount. They have a lot of rental properties. So just so you know how I walked through this or how I did that assessment there, right? You're like, how, how did he know that? Uh, or if you're in, in property, you know, you've, you also, you're, you're like me and you're analyzing a lot of properties, you know what you're looking for is, again, there are, it's like, oh, sorry, I have a comma in there. So what I'm looking at, or what I saw was that this was 1981, and this was the last time the ownership changed hands, meaning they have owned this property for almost 40 years, or for, yeah, almost 40 years. Um, and so I'm like, they're probably, I'm guessing they hadn't lived in one unit for 40 years. So they probably have this as an investment property. And if it's a, if it's an investment property, they probably have others. And I like that the fact that they're old, they're probably older because they've owned this for 40 years. They're not, you know, under 30 because that's not possible. Uh, I don't think, I actually don't know if that's, you can have, yeah, let's not get into all that. Um, but that means they've, they've been doing this for a long time. They probably have other properties. They're probably retired. They're retiring, they're retiring and, they're re and they have other properties. They might be selling all their properties at one time, which gets really interesting. And if it's been under one manager for that long time, maybe they're a really good manager and I can get one full sweep and get a lot of properties. This gets really exciting, right? So we're getting, we're getting a little bonus here, analyzing properties. Okay, let's get back to what we're doing. <laughs> so back to this. Will taxes go up? probably quite a bit. So I'm going to assume a 50% increase. Right now I have this not based on, this is just based on this closing costs um, because maybe the assessment doesn't go, that's an unknown. Like I don't know if taxes are going to increase by the time I refinance. It might not. Um, okay. So I'm still doing 189 purchase price, 189. We'll get into this in a second. This actually might be really nice. Uh, but pre, um, so my first loan, 30 year term, 3%, 25% uh, down. I'm going to hold this for one year. Actually, I might even do six months. And then I'll refinance. It's based on years. So I need to do 0.5, one divided by... Why am I not thinking about this right? <laughs> one year. Oh, six. I, I screwed myself. Six divided by 12. Six months divided by 12. Wow. And I... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I am literally a, a quote unquote math person and I I really couldn't think through that. I was like one divided by something. I don't know where I got one. Anyways, no justification. I messed that up. Those are those numbers. But the big one is going to be based on the whole point of the refi of this uh, burr is to refinance and pull some money out. And so that will be based on the appraisal on the refinance. What are they going to appraise this for? Well, actually, I have, and this is another reason, you know, I love this calculator is... If it's based on, I have it where if it's based on less than four units, it's going to be based on a comp, which will be right here. And I'll walk through this in a sec. If it's not, it's based on this formula, which is the NOI. And you'll have to put in for a commercial, the selling cap rate, which would be, what are the cap rates going in your area? If you go into LoopNet, you'll see, you know, multifamily, you'll see seven, eight, 7.5, seven, 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 seven. You're like, oh, they're selling for 7%. So you would just put in 7% down here. It would calculate based on an NOI and we can do that. So I can just switch this. Let's say this was a commercial. It was more than five units. I'll switch that to greater than four. And then all of a sudden, this property is only worth 184,000 instead of the 246 because it's based on the NOI. And so that's where there might be a huge advantage here and where I have actually personally seen, I really like this huge disconnect of what uh, these rental properties will appraise for, for residential loans. So we'll go back to less than four. 
So again, this is based on F58, which is right here, this 256. You may be like, what the heck is this? What's really nice is these are comps that I actually used, um, I believe for another duplex in this area. And so what I do is you'll go through and you can actually, I'll just show you what I'll do. I'll go into uh, Zillow and I'll look at, okay, I'm looking at this area. Actually, I'll zoom in even more and let's remove this. We'll draw it and we'll say it's this area. Nice little circle there. I'll apply it and say, okay, this is the area I'm looking at. I'm still looking at multifamily, but I want to see what's sold because it's based on the comps. It's based on what's sold. Um, it still needs to be multifamily for something similar. And then I'll actually go down here and say, I want it sold in the last six months because there might not be a ton if I do like 30 days. There's zero, right? There's zero that's sold in this area. So six months. So I'll go through these. And what I'll do is I will go and say, okay, how much did it sell for? Is there any adjustments? The adjustments are if there's a garage, I technically that that home sold, you know, like this one right here, right? Uh, let me see if I have a good example. Um, okay, so this adjustment actually wouldn't work because I need to I need to adjust it to match my property. And so I'm trying to see. Um, Okay, so like this example, this property that was that I saw that was selling for 189,000, and I gotta forget that I keep this really small. I should have been making this bigger. Hopefully, you guys can see and follow along. It sold for 190, uh, 195,000, but there was a porch, and so it's like, well, technically, what is this? What was that house worth minus a porch? If a porch is worth 2,000, I'll need to subtract 2,000, so it was actually worth 190. 3,000, there was 12, and then I would put in that there was 1,200 square feet. It would calculate adju the adjusted price per square feet. I'll take an average of all those, of the comps, multiply it by what m the price per square foot of my, our property was. And if we go back to our property, I think, I mean, it was 19, oh, there it is, 1920. So I put in 1920 that, and that will actually, that matters a lot. And, and well, actually I'm going to just get rid of all these adjustments for now, because what they do is they adjust to your property, right? So in this, I mean, in this example, I could technically keep it because there's no porch. So I would need to adjust it. So it's like, oh, I need to, th that property at 195,000 had a porch. So I need to subtract 2000. So it's like, actually this sold for 193,000 for the building. And these other ones, if there's garages, I need to add, uh, subtract the cost of a garage to more equal my place. I hope, hopefully that makes sense. It's a little confusing. If it is confusing, just ignore the adjustment and it'll still give you a good idea. Let's just do that. We'll ignore it. We'll say this will give us a good idea. It's saying the average price per square foot is about actually $173 of what have sold. Um, if I look at this at 936, that looks too small for a duplex. A lot of these, I mean, 14, 11, we'll even just assume just because we're messing around with this. We'll just assume these are actually like 1500 because those, those look really small. Maybe these were actually for a single family home. And that gets me a lot closer. 1500 for a square, uh, that, that's 750 per unit. That's more reasonable. A 1920 total square feet, almost a thousand per unit. It's actually really large. And so you actually might see uh, where this actually sells for a little bit less because it might not be directly proportional that if everything's selling for $136 a square foot, they might say, well, those are smaller. And so it's not gonna be quite one-to-one -one match, but let's just say that actually it works to our advantage. That everything's smaller and they utilize that same $136 a square foot, they multiply it by our 1920, they get $261,000. So that's what this number is. When I refinance, um, what happens is because it's a duplex, usually it's 25%. For duplexes down, you put down 25%, but on the cash out refinance, which is what you need, you don't need to just a normal refinance, you need the cash out refinance. Um, and we could do a whole number. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. And essentially you want to get cash out. They, If you just do a normal refinance, they'll just pay off your loan, but you want the difference between, they'll take the 261, uh, they'll multiply it by 70%, so 100% minus the 30%, and then, and the, and the reason why this is white is I'm just adding uh, 5% because it's usually 5% higher for the cash out refinance. It might be different at your bank. You'll have to ask. I know we're getting into, into a little bit more complex things and I'm trying to explain these the best I can. So again, ask any questions you want. But I'll, And that's why the beauty of this calculator, it'll do so much for you. <laughs> 261,000 times 70% gets me 182,000. They will take the 182,000. They will 
pay off the 141,000 or how much is left of the mortgage. And the difference is what they give me, right? So if I start doing some of this math, as I take the 182, they'll, they'll take that, they'll, start, they'll subtract the 141,000. I'll have $41,000 back. Well, I actually, uh, what I mean, what else was included in this, and this is what this formula does, is it takes, how, so I had my, uh, the 189,000 includes the loan plus my down payment, plus my repairs, plus my inspection, plus my total refinance. That's how much I had, that's like the total amount invested. But they're gonna give me 182,000, so how much is left over? Well, I still have $19,000 that's left in the deal that didn't get paid off. So essentially, I started with 60 grand, right? And when I refinanced, they paid me back about, you know, the 41,000. So I still have 20,000 that didn't get paid back that's in the property, okay? So that's kind of, that's kind of the uh, essentially what you want is is you want zero <laughs> that you got all your money back that you could go back and buy something else. That's still really good. I pulled out 40 grand and I can probably, you know, almost go buy another property. That's that's really nice. It's better than keeping 60 grand in a property and uh, having to save that all up again. So I, I do like seeing that. I really do like seeing that. But it's red because I actually rather see this under, my, my, my criteria for this conditional formatting is 10,000. So actually, if we started seeing, like let's say this one was actually just 1,000 square feet. No, not 100, 1,000. It changes your price per square foot because now there's less square feet, so the price per square foot's higher. So actually, the comps are $147 a square foot, making this worth $281,000. So if it's worth $281,000 and I have 70%, they're giving me $197,000 to pay off everything. And so now we only have $4,000 left in the deal. I got that 50 out of my $60,000 I put in here. They paid me back $55,000 at closing. Amazing. I can go now go buy another property. That I like seeing. So let's just keep these numbers just for the sake of it. And so we have all our numbers pre. We were, we were previously cash flowing 334. After we refinance, we have only $44 of cash flow. This is green again because I just want to break even because as we saw before, over time, we can increase our rents. We have, you know, the appreciation and everything and, and the value goes up, the mortgage that is paid down. We have tax benefits. There's so many benefits that I, I just want to at least break even that first year so nothing's coming out of the pocket. But the reason it's higher is because our first loan was 141000 but after we refinanced, you know, it's based on a much higher amount. Our loan is now 197000 Also, you might notice our interest rate's higher. For cash out refinances, typically what I've seen is an extra 50 basis points um, on your interest rate versus their traditional purchase price interest rate. And that's why it's white, as I just add 50%, uh, 50 basis points. So our principal and interest goes up, our taxes go up. Um, so I currently, the way I have do this, and you can customize it how you want, is uh, although my 7.5% changed, is really I, I'm basing it on a higher rent, but handy dandy calculator, I could say, well, I did all these rehabs. So post rehab, maybe it's actually 5% for repairs. And I actually maybe I did, well, I didn't do any big CapEx. Um, so I'm gonna keep saving the same amount. So actually my monthly repairs is gonna be lower. And, and this is white because I'm taking care of it down here. Um, let me zoom in a little bit for you. Utilities stay the same. Vacancy, I, I might want to save, you know, the same percentage, but it, but you know, I have a higher principal and interest and higher taxes, so I need to save a little bit more, and everything else stays the same. So um, I'm cash flowing ninety four bucks. That's this is actually a really good property. Uh, well, my comps, I would need to go back and adjust my comps. Oh, if you're wondering what this is down here, just because I've almost completely forgot about this, I just have another little section where I can go through and find all the addresses, find comparable properties for how much the you know for the square footage how much they're renting and then i'll do an average to say what what's the average rent for this property just to get an idea nice little spot and i usually put my zillow link so i can just copy and refer to them later okay going back so i look at this property so what gets interesting here <laughs> 23 percent cash on cash return you're like well my cash flow went down why is my my cash on cash going up because now it's based on what's left of the property, technically, because you got all that money back, right? The way you could look at it is say, well, it only cost me five grand to uh, purchase this property, and I'm making $100 or $4,000 uh, 
a year. There's something I'm questioning. Hold on. What am I? Oh, there it is. I was like 4,000 divided by 5,000 should be what? 80% return. I'm like, why is this 23%? This yearly figure. Yeah. It's based on the pre. <laughs> I was just about to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're making, uh, 12,000 a year on the 5,000 or so. And that's where you get the 23%. Okay. That makes more sense. <coughs> cap rates again what is my noi once i add back you know my proper uh, principal and interest my debt service plus my capex divided by my purchase amount um seven percent which is okay i'm making 125 percent you know debt service more more important for uh going forward for commercial properties the flipped profit is not something you see here because technically I'm not doing some rehab and I'm not assessing what I think it's going to be worth post rehab. And so I added this in here because it's something I consider. I'm like, if I just flip this property, if I sold it for this 281,000 and I also have some uh, assumptions here, when I, uh, when I sell it, I'm going to probably use a realtor, which is about 6%. And I also have to maybe pay some taxes, which will put 25%. So, because if I'm not selling it, I'm not paying those fees. So just to make it more comparable, what could I earn? And so this formula goes through and calculates based on, you know, you can change it for how you want, but I'm taking after I pay realtor fees, after I pay taxes and pay everything, all my, you know, my rehab, I'm making $47,000. Maybe I think that's better than keeping this property because technically I could take this and go invest this at that 7% and I'm earning a good amount. It's like, okay, this gets really interesting. <laughs> okay. So we have our, uh, so we'll, let's just do, we have our year 30 metrics and we'll keep this. And so what gets, what's really, in, what I really like about this calculator is I can do, this is all based on both assessments or what I mean is both time periods, both pre refinance and post refinance. And that's where this all comes into play right here, right? This duration. And so this figure, right? Isn't based on, oh, what is my year 30 metrics? post it's the combination of both because that's the way you should look at it right it's like if i have what i mean is is if i have if i if let's say i don't do this watch how this adjusts let's say i it takes 15 years before i refinance so for 15 years i'm getting you know maybe more cash flow uh, but my property's not worth more well, we can just see how this adjusts right so we're looking at these metrics let's just look at our, our compounded return so if i if i take 15 years before i refinance my return goes down not much i would assume so my cat is it my cash flow that goes down? No. Okay, I know what this is. So, what what, the, what if you look at right here the cumulative cash flow? Watch what happens when I put this year fifteen. Drops a ton, three hundred thousand dollar difference. The reason for that is if you start looking at your earnings of what you can reinvest. Uh, actually, if we go over to annual, one of my cash flow, my cash flow is so high because I do the cash out refinance, cash out. I'm pulling cash out. I could technically, if I don't want to go buy another property, I could take that 55,000, go invest it at 7%. That's the difference. And so that compounded return, the difference of getting it 15 years early was 300,000. And so if I actually just start doing that, just to see if that's actually the case. So it's actually a difference of 15 years of compounding, I think is how I need to think about it. Let's just see if this gives me close. 115 is actually the full 30 year difference. Is that how I need to think about it? It gets messed. I mean, there's so much more. It's probably more complicated than I need to think about off the top of my head. But that's partially the reason why it, it messes up with the cumulative cash flows is that cash out refinance. So we have our, we're looking at your year 30 metric. We're going to refinance in duration, you know, six months from now or the fifth, uh, halfway through the first year. So for the first six months, what you'll see, and this is how this all works, for this first six months, we're, we're doing it based on the pre. Uh, you know, pre refinance. And then month seven, it switches over and we start getting the higher amount. And if I, if it, just to see this a little bit better, if I just do, you know, year one, we go back over year one, you know, we're, we're coming along, we're having that 1750 the pre, and then we hit year two and we have the 1990. Um, and so that's what it starts out as. It starts as the 1990. And if we get to year three, right? it increases by 3%, right? And so then every year it'll go up and you'll see the mortgage, it jumped up at the same time as well 
because we refinanced and because we refinanced, you'll see this influx of earnings because also there's not only uh, the, the property went up in value. Um, and so you should see cumulative equity jumped because we actually earned a lot because we made it worth more and it got appraised more. We did a capital refinance. We got the 55,000. So you see this whole monthly breakdown and then you have this little yearly section. So you don't have to look at a monthly basis. You can just see what's going on yearly. And that just gives you a whole idea of what's going on. I mean, big picture from an analyzing standpoint, if actually the comps were like this, I'd be very interested. I think it's probably something closer to 50. I'd have to go through find all these properties, do the adjustments, make sure these are accurate. $136 a square foot. Actually, I think mine appraised for about 140 a square foot. So this isn't off. And then it's like I'm leaving 20 grand in, but I'm cash flowing more because my loan amount is lower. Um, but my overall return isn't as great because I'm not getting that cash as early, I think is the case, 11%. But if I drop this down to 1,000, does it increase? It's about the same. I'd have to think through that a little bit more. But overall, it's a good property. It, if this is your first property, these numbers are actually looking pretty good because, because I'm cash flowing that year one, right? I'm pulling back most of my money for the refinance, which I like to see. If you were keeping this property, your cash flow, you know, even if you weren't cash flowing, later on, you are. I mean, in year third, or even if we just did year 10, I'm, I'm cash flowing $2,000 a year. Uh, which is pretty good. I'm making a hundred thousand dollars from all you know the appreciation and everything else, which is really nice. You have the mortgage pay down going on. You have tax benefits. There's just a lot to be excited about here. And so again, I, I, thirty years is a long time to think about. So in year ten, again, uh, it'll, it'll adjust to the post uh, numbers. Making five thousand dollars a year is okay per property. That means in ten years. Um, you know, I'm sitting at 36 years old and if I, you know, just even 10 of these, I'm making 50 grand a year off my properties, which is pretty good. But then I also have 156,000. So actually if I had 10 of these that were identical, I'd have $1.5 million of equity, which is amazing. And it actually gets really exciting because if I'm refinancing and I'm pulling back, you know, 40 grand, I, you know, I almost have enough or in the case where, again, if we just, we're, we're messing with the numbers, but just to give, to show you where I'm pulling almost all my money, this is green because I only have four thousand dollars left of the property i pulled out fifty five thousand so i can go buy more properties that means 155 like you know it's hard because this isn't actually i'm not pulling all my money out but if assuming i was again adjusting the numbers so wow i pulled out all sixty thousand that means i only needed to save up sixty thousand one time and, and and then six months i refinance use that sixty thousand dollars buy another one fix it up six months refinance again the reason for the six months is some uh people have seasoning periods where the banks require you to wait six months but if you do um let me think about this for a sec if you purchase it in cash I, I, I'm, I'm just throwing out everything for you guys if you purchase it in cash you can actually refinance almost instantly and you can still base it on it gets really more nuanced just keep in mind if you do a down payment with 25% and you get a loan right away. Usually they want you to hold it from six months to a year. So anyways, you can use that $60,000 over and over and over. So you only need to save up once. If you do that 10 times, um, you know, you're at 30,000. The number's adjusted because now I, I have a higher debt amount because I, I pulled out more money. Um, but I, I have $30,000. But if I had 10 of these, I'd have $1.8 million of equity. And it only cost me $60,000. That looks pretty dang good to me. So lastly, let's say I'm like, I want to remember this. I can go print. And it's like, I have this nice little report. And you might, if you want to be able to see it a little bit better. Let's see. I'm just trying to make sure you can see it on both uh, screens here. So essentially, I have pre-refinance, post-refinance, how much you know of incomes coming in, expenses, what my cash flow is, my NOI, my cap rate, my cash and cash return, uh, pre-refinance, you know how much am I going to need for a down payment, uh, what are my my loan terms, post-refinance, what is it worth, what are my pre-refinance and post-refinance expenses, how are those made up, and I can compare them, um, and then what what are those key metrics, right, that I was looking at before that I can compare on an in you know at, at big you know those years that people think about one five 10 15 20 30 years um in 30 years i've have cumulative uh earnings of 1.5 million dollars from this one property worth 60 percent, which is a 12 percent compounded return that's pretty good i mean especially if you think you could you know your alternative is seven percent you know index funds or something this is actually a pretty good property let alone tax benefits right 
And so you have this little 30 year projection. Um, and what it is is the yellow is the cash flows of reinvested. Um, your and then your cumulative equity earned this little blue line. I should probably you should probably change. We should probably change these <laughs> to make the a little bit different. But the dark blue is the equity, meaning we knew that we bought it when it was worth one hundred eighty nine thousand, but it went up to three hundred thousand. And then over time, that three hundred thousand was going up by three percent every year. And so you see that little, little gradual increase. Um, the reason why the cash flows, even though they were also increasing at three percent, the reason why it, it's actually more is because there's that widening cash flow spread because the mortgage amount is staying constant. So even though expenses are increasing, the mortgage is staying the same. Uh, you lock in that rate for 30 years, but you're in your cash flow, which is pretty high, you know, or your income is pretty high at that 1990, and that's increasing at a higher rate than your expenses. So you get a little bit widening, uh, you know, gradual increase. I mean, these, and you're actually reinvesting this at 7%. So then it, you, you get a nice little steep curve. And then finally, those add those two to number, and you just see, you know, you start at zero, you earn zero at, at the beginning, and over time, you're making over, you know, 1.5 million dollars from this property. Do I think that's realistic? Yes, I actually, I, I do under. I mean, I, I, that's the beauty of real estate. That's why. But you, you have to hold it for a long time. You have to get that. You have to increase your rent every year. You have to. I mean, this we're applying. I mean, maybe this changes if you only can get one percent of your expenses are going up three uh, percent. Maybe you know, maybe it's not. The, you're not making that million dollars, right? You know, something, you're not getting that huge appreciation. Maybe this doesn't, again, we had a lot of crazy assumptions here. Maybe, you know, your your comp is, uh, your appraisal, it's not worth as much as you thought. So again, if we start going back and look at that report, um, now you're back to 8% over 30 years. Those, those, those assumptions matter. You're making a lot of assumptions. So that's why you have to invest in the areas you know, that you're familiar with, that you enjoy, uh, not that you enjoy, you don't. Well, yeah, you have to enjoy. It. You have to like where you're investing, <laughs> um, and and just so you know, this little report's over here, so you can adjust it any way you want it. That was a lot. Um, I think we went over everything. I if you have questions, feel free to reach me, reach out. I'll put there's links in my. Uh, I'll be posting this on YouTube. There'll be links to my Twitter account, the uh, where you know you can DM me there. You can met, if you're purchasing this uh, template, you can message me on Etsy where I'm selling it. Uh, my website's down below. You can contact me on there. I have all my recommended books. Uh, I'll actually be streaming more on Twitch to look at properties and analyze properties just like this because then I'm it's for my benefit. Um, I'll, I can also analyze any pro properties that you know, you have that you're, you're on the fence about if you don't know if you should purchase them or not. Um, again, check out my website. I'm, I love this stuff, guys. I absolutely love this. And I really appreciate you guys. Uh, if you've watched this far, thank you so much. Um, I hope this is helpful. And again, please, I love talking about this. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, so guys and ladies, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. And I hope you enjoy and I'll see you soon. Thank you.